Namaste. I wanted to say a little bit more about the Brahmastra and Pashupatastra. I'm kind of surprised that nobody made a comment on the original video going, and what the heck is Pashupatastra? <laughs> because not many people know what it is. Huh? You know, I do these things on purpose in my videos. I leave certain loose ends. I'll leave certain terms not fully defined. Just to see if anybody is paying attention. <laughs> as far as I can tell, nobody is. <laughs> nobody has gone through my series with a, with a fine-tooth comb and actually correlated everything. If you did, you would blow your mind. And I don't see any blown minds out there. So I guess, you know, nobody's really got it yet. But anyway, Brahmastra is a heat weapon. It's like I said, introducing a higher energy level into a lower stratum, a more dense and cool stratum of existence. And so it causes all kinds of havoc. Huh? Uh, by taking things apart from the outside. Smash, kaboom, like a hydrogen bomb. The Pashupatastra, on the other hand, is far more powerful. The Brahmastra could destroy any, any form in the universe, uh, maybe even a galaxy or whatever. Huh? But the Pashupatastra can dissolve the universe itself back into nothing. So it's a much more dangerous weapon. How does it work? Well, <laughs> it works by actually undoing the illusory existence of the material universe either locally or globally, depending on how it's configured. Well, what does that mean? Okay. First of all, you have to look at the world <laughs> from the point of view of Pashupati, the owner of the Astra. Pashupati is Shiva. Shiva as the master or protector of all the animals, Pashu. Animals <laughs> means also human beings who are like animals, which is, you know, 99 plus percent of the population, meaning they have no self-realization. If you don't have actual self-realization, you're a Pashu, you're an animal, you're not fully a human being, according to the Vedas. So anyway, you would come under Lord Shiva, now, because of this, Shiva has got the reputation of being the demigod or the, the uh, how can I say, incarnation of the quality, the guna avatar of darkness or ignorance, tamoguna. But actually, <laughs> this is only because of his uh, uh, main function, which is to dissolve things to unmock things, to, to strip off the coverings of illusion and show things as they really are. And of course, and people hate that. <laughs> they, they hate death. They resist it. It's dissolution, you see. They don't like. But anyway, Shiva is absolutely necessary. <laughs> And he is actually the Ishwara. He comes first. And he's the last one to go at the end. Okay, so from the point of view of Shiva, there's Brahman, which is everything and limitless. 
Then there's the individual self. Then there's consciousness, the senses, the mind, the world, God, etc. That's backwards from our usual conception, which is that I am an individual in the world and God is somewhere, you know, outside maybe, I don't know. We don't see God. Uh, that's because we're looking at the world through the senses. So the process of meditation is first to still the mind, uh, disconnect the mind from the senses, close the sense doors, huh? turn around, put the attention on oneself, I am, the feeling of I am. And then gradually sink down into the self until you reach the bottom. Now, at this point, you are in what is normally deep sleep consciousness, but you're awake. So, in this state of consciousness, you can feel surrounded by Brahman, that you are in the arms of Brahman. You are in sitting on the lap of this limitless being, enfolded, protected. Uh, there is no universe, there is no senses, no mind, no ego. So this same process uh, of self-realization dissolves the world. We don't see the world. The world doesn't exist from this perspective. When we invoke this perspective the whole world disappears. So, this is the Pashupatastra. Now, where did I get the clue? <laughs> when I was a boy, I had my workshop in the basement of our big old three-story frame house in New Jersey. And when I wanted to do something really, really sketchy, <laughs> I would go down there at night. And of course, since we had so many spies in the neighborhood, I couldn't turn on the lights. So I would go sneak downstairs and go into the kitchen without turning on any lights, without making a sound, you know, barefoot or in socks. And I would get to the head of the basement stairs. And then I would go down one or two steps, turn around and close the basement door. <coughs> Clean, right, as soundlessly as possible. Then I would turn around in pitch blackness and feel my way down the steps until I got to the concrete floor in the bottom. So this is exactly how it feels <laughs> when you go into the self. You, you uh, go through the mind. First you turn off the gross senses and then you're just in the mind. That's like going through the kitchen and then going down the basement steps. Then you turn around and close the door even to the mind. It's like, see you later, click. <laughs> and then you turn around, you turn away from the mind. You forget all about the mind. And walk down the steps. And what's that? Walking down the steps means sinking into the self, letting go of the boundaries between I and not I, 
between self and others until the boundary of individuality is completely dissolved. Then you're on the floor, <laughs> on the solid bottom. That's the self. So you see, this is so, so easy to realize, but most people cling to the ego in the world and the senses and all that crap. <laughs> I don't know why. Because what is the world? Huh? The world is matter, right? But even modern science now will tell you that matter is mostly empty space. Well, what is matter anyway? We talked some time ago about vortex theory. I think there's two videos, vortex theory and more vortex theory. Vortex theory is the idea that when you take energy and move it in a vortex, in a spiral curve, it acquires mass, fake mass, huh? but it still has the effect of mass. So for all practical purposes, it is mass. And I gave the example of the ocean waves, the ocean waves coming. Huh? What are they? First of all, they're just vibrations in the water caused by wind. So the water is vibrating up and down. Huh? And normally it's not a big deal, you know. If you're out in, this, in the middle of the ocean, waves are going up and down, okay. But when it gets near the shore, the decreasing depth compresses the energy. And at a certain point, it'll rear up and form a vortex, and that's a breaker. A breaker is a vortex in the ocean, okay? So what happens when you get hit by a breaker? Huh? You get hit by an ordinary wave, it's nothing. You just bob up and down. Huh? But when you get hit by a breaker, kapow! Why? Fake mass. It's the same water, but now it's in a state of turbulence. And because it's turbulent, it appears to have much more mass, much more momentum, much more impact when it hits you, isn't it? So this is fake mass. It has the effect of mass, but the same amount of water is still there. It just seems to be heavier and bigger and stronger. Strange, isn't it? No. Because the whole world is like that. Look in, what is an atom? An atom is nothing but a vortex of electromagnetic energy. Huh? Little spinny thing. <laughs> and because of that, it appears to have mass. What happens if you have a spinning top and you try to move it? Huh? It resists, doesn't it? Normally, the top has no resistance. You can move it any way you want. But when the top is spinning, when it's in the momentum of a vortex, it resists motion along certain axes, isn't it? Same with any, any matter. <laughs> it's simply an electrical charge in spinning in a vortex. And because of that, it, does, it resists changing di directions or orientations. This is matter, folks. It's mostly empty space with a couple of little electric charges spinning around like mad. And you get a bunch of these, huh? You get a whole trillions of them and line them up in certain ways. And they have all kinds of different properties. And this is what we call matter. And matter, solid matter, has a lot more resistance than simply electric charges in space. That's because it's in vortex. See? The vortex creates fake mass. Well, what is mass? It's just resistance. The more mass you have, the more force you have to use to accelerate it, to, to push it. Isn't it? That's basic physics. So... 
What happens when you uh, break the vortex, when you unmock this uh, spinning top? Huh? First of all, it releases a lot of energy. Like when a wave breaks, it creates all this spray and bubbles, foam, right? So what, what was the individual being, but only the, the spray, the droplets, and the foam, the bubbles from the breaking waves of the vortex of the universe? See? And, and as soon as that vortex of the individual droplet breaks or the individual bubble in the foam, as soon as the, the boundary breaks, pop, there's nothing left, and it just gets absorbed back into the ocean. Because it was never more than the ocean anyway. It was always the ocean. So in the same way, the universe... <laughs> When you unmock, when you unspin all of the, the pieces of it, it falls to nothing. It is nothing. It's nothing. It's only consciousness in a vortex. Duh. What I've been telling you guys for years. So when you sit there and you withdraw the mind from the senses, uh, and then you turn the mind within to contemplate yourself, your authentic self. You find that you're nothing but consciousness. And then relaxing into that, you find more than that, you're just a bubble of consciousness in an ocean of consciousness. The ocean of Brahman. And that's how the Pashupatastra works. <laughs> Om Tatsan. Om Harihi Aung. <laughs>